to the Prime Minister. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we've just heard from that great sycophant of billionaires, the leader on both of the sides, and we are going to make our country great again. Tuesday afternoon? No, it's Thursday afternoon. It starts with a T, though. That's the <laughs> I got that right. Every Thursday afternoon, we have a chat with Mark Latham. Hello, Mark. G'day, Brent. How are you going? I'm good, mate. How are you? I'm very well. I've had a good week. I showed good judgment on Tuesday night by going to bed early instead of sitting up and watching the soccer. Yeah, I know. Uh, dear. I just had a chap on the phone and he was saying, yesterday I made the comment about are we wasting our money and time with soccer internationally? I mean, we haven't done real well, have we? 850,000 people watched that on SBS. I saw the ratings figure uh, yesterday and... There must have been some sore heads, tired people around on the Wednesday. But anyway, I'm fresh as a daisy, I can report. Oh, it was good to see you on the telly on Monday night. Oh, good, yeah, I think that went well. It was an interesting discussion. Um, I've never been on a panel with Graham Richardson, who's obviously got a lot of uh, experience uh, about federal politics and remarkably keeps his hand in. You know, he's one of those guys who spent his entire life on the phone, first as a Labor Party numbers man and now as a media person just trying to keep up with the latest gossip so uh, he's quite incredible yeah so it was good to see you back on telly enjoyed it all right well, let's let's talk about bill shorten uh, has ha, well it says bill shorten has put his leadership on the line after making a captain's call to repeal this 20 billion in legislative tax cuts for up to 20,000 businesses do you do you think that he has actually um, you know put the leadership on the line well, it's very unusual. I can only remember one other time where a political party has promised to reverse taxation measures, uh, and that was Kim Beasley saying he was going to roll back the GST. Uh, that never happened, of course. But that was a tax increase he was going to abolish. This is actually a tax decrease that Bill Shorten is talking about repealing. So that that's quite incredible in itself, that you don't really see political parties that watch legislation pass through the parliament, new laws to cut taxes, and they say, no, we don't like that, we'll actually increase your taxes for you. And, you know, it's such bad economic policy, and, and overall, Labor is in very, very dangerous circumstances. Shorten's leadership could be threatened, but more importantly, the Australian economy is at risk because Labor's come up with policies for $200 billion worth of new taxes, that's in capital gains tax, negative gearing and dividend imputation measures, and on top of that, they're now talking about repealing $100 billion of income tax cuts. That's the income tax seven-year government package plus uh, this part of the company tax reduction. So combined, it's a $300 billion tax sledgehammer, which really would threaten to flatten the Australian economy, to smash it to pieces. So, you know, I just think this is very, very dangerous economic policy by Labor, and I worry about people you know, who could lose their jobs if uh, this massive tax hike was ever implemented. I heard one com commentator say that um, on the day that Bill Shorten made the announcement, it was the biggest hand-up that Malcolm Turnbull has had in a long time to win the next election. Would you concur with that? Well, if Turnbull can't campaign effectively on Labor's $300 billion tax sledgehammer, well, he ought to give the game away. Same with Scott Morrison and Finance Minister Matthias Cormann. Yeah, you've got to say politically, if a government can't make... Uh, issues out of that there's something wrong with them but you know what, what's happened to the Labor Party I can remember the Hawke and Keating governments talking about the importance of reducing tax Paul Keating himself has said that the top marginal rate should have a three at the front of it so it's in the 30s mm -hmm. not the 40s you yeah. know it's always been seen in Australian politics that tax reductions added to incentive to investment to productivity um, created jobs made the country wealthier as you'd expect nobody likes paying tax it's a drain on the effort that we make as, as workers, as citizens, as business owners. So Labor's reversed all that. Maybe it's part of this international trend. You see it with Jeremy Corbyn in the UK, with Bernie Sanders in the US. And there's a lot of cranky people out there that haven't had a, a wage increase for a long while. So the politics of envy seems to be back in fashion, particularly through Bill Shorten. Well, Anthony Albanese last Friday, they say maybe he fired the starting gun on a Labor leadership contest, but there was an article in The Australian written by uh, Peter Van Olsen, I think it was, about the kerfuffle that one has to go through to change the leadership of the Labor Party as a direct result of, of what Kevin Rudd put in place. Uh, it almost seems impossible for it to happen. Well, it means Labor would be immersed in a leadership ballot for months on end which would be an incentive for Malcolm Turnbull to call an early election, basically to say Labor can't work out who uh, they've got as their leader, and, and if they can't sort that out, they can't run the country. So that, that's a valid point. The, the, the Rudd rules mean that 
of the voting panel comes from inside the Labor caucus, the Labor parliamentarians. The other 50% is a vote of every Labor Party branch member around the country. And that takes months to organise and finalise. So, yeah, it would be a prolonged process. And I think I've mentioned to you previously, my view on the Labor leadership is that the Albanese threat is real. He'd love to take over. If Shorten um, was to lose two of these by-elections, say Longman and Braddon, then uh, Labor would be looking seriously at getting rid of him. Uh, how do they do that? I, I think effectively the only way you can get rid of a Labor leader um, uh, midstream if you like, is a, a delegation of his senior colleagues to go and say, Bill, your time's up, we're tapping yeah. you on the shoulder, you should resign. Yeah, that not delegation the would need to be comprised of people like Tanya Plibersek, Penny Wong, Chris Bowen, Tony Burke. You'd need four or five very senior people to go talk short and into resigning, and even then he might resist. He might say, look, I've been in, the, in front of the polls for a couple of years and, and I deserve my chance, and he could well, he could well dig in and, uh, short, and, and Turnbull, in those circumstances, would call an early election. Uh, Longman and Braddon, I mean, you never know until the, uh, until the fat lady sings, as they say, but uh, it's not looking too favourable. Those two seats aren't looking too favourable for Labor at the moment. No, I think Labor Party insiders are resigned to losing Braddon. This is in the um, northwestern part of Tasmania, and they've pretty well given up on that one. Um, Labor in Tasmania at state level has lurched very much to the left and had an appalling result in the recent state election. And the Will Hodgman government down there is very, very popular, got near 50% of the primary vote, which is you know, unheard of in modern politics. So Labor's got some problems in Braddon, um, and they've given that away. So I think that'll be one loss for Shorten. The key one really is Logman. I don't think Shorten could sustain a second by-election Lost. There's only been one other occasion that uh, an opposition party's lost a by-election to the government, and that was 100 years ago in very unique circumstances. So to lose two, I think, may well be the end of, of Bill Shorten. Longman, you look at these polls and the circumstances up there, it probably is on a knife edge. It probably is a 50-50 seat. And, um, you know, uh, if you live in Longman there on the Queensland Sunshine Coast, you're going to get more pampering and promises yes. from politicians yes. than in a month of Sundays. It's going to be full on. How much do you think the Pauline Hanson effect is going to play in the, uh, in the Longman by-election? Well, Labor, Labor's embarked on an interesting strategy there. One of the reasons they won the seat at the last election, getting rid of Wyatt Roy, the young uh, Liberal MP, was that Labor received One Nation preferences in that seat. Um, but now Labor is very critical of Hanson. They've, they're really at each other's throat. And Hanson is saying she'll preference Labor second last ahead of only the, the Greens. So effectively, she's going to preference the Liberal Party candidate in Longman. One Nation is polling, and you'd expect them to get 15% of the primary vote. They'll have a lot of volunteers handing out those um, how-to-vote cards that assist the, 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 the Turnbull government. So it, it, it's a big factor for sure. All right, well, today it was only announced, I think, earlier this morning that uh, the Finance Minister, Matthias Gormans, raised the white flag. Uh, I saw Pauline Hanson, I think it was last night, on an interview on one of the TV channels, and she was saying the decision has to be made today on the corporate tax, but it's been put off. Uh, they're going to uh, pass it in, if you like, and, bef and so it's not going to happen before the Super Saturday by-elections. No, this uh, is the last sitting day of the Parliament before the winter break, so it'll come back in the spring sittings, a month from now, and I suppose the government is looking for one nation in particular to roll over. Peter Giorgio, the Hanson's colleague, uh, the WA senator, has been on TV saying that uh, if certain conditions are met, they might look at this corporate tax cut. This is the, the, the cut for businesses with a turnover in excess of $50 million a year, so mm. it's effectively big business. We've had cuts for small business, medium-sized business, and now they're looking at big business cuts. And uh, they're going to come back, really, and, and, and put more pressure on One Nation, um, put some inducements there, and Cormann's going to have another bite of that cherry. What did uh, Cormann said today that the, the people of Longman and Braddon should vote for the government in the upcoming by-elections and send a message to Bill Shorten about his plans to raise taxes? Well, that's the drumbeat, you know. Labor has got itself into a situation where they're promising $300 billion dollars worth of tax increases. That's, that's repealing existing tax cuts plus the new tax increases that Labor's got in mind. You know, the, the, we've never seen an economic policy like this. You know, uh, normally political parties are very cautious 
normally it's seen that uh, increasing taxes is political debt. Uh, so, I don't know, Shorten, he must have a different read on the electorate than, than, than most of us. Let's see what happens. Speaking of Pauline Hanson, she's come out and said that uh, the nation should decide uh, with a plebiscite, that she, we should hold a plebiscite in tandem with the next federal election to allow Australian people to have their say on whether migration levels should be scaled back. Well, immigration's way too big. I'm sure the majority of Australians, you see it in the opinion polls, say that you know, cities like Sydney are bursting at the seams. We just can't sustain this level of population growth. Uh, there's statistics showing that uh, two-thirds of the new jobs created in Australia are taken by recently arrived migrants. It's putting pressure on housing prices. You know, this is not a negative comment about people who've come here and worked hard and, 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 and migrated to Australia and been successful. It's just a reality to say, look, there's a reason to have a pause in big migration for the benefit of the people who live here now. Whether you arrived last year or, or your family came here 100 years ago, we've all got an interest in saying immigration is too big in excess of 200,000 a year. So I think it would be good to get the people involved. How would you frame the question? Well, it couldn't be a yes or no question. You'd have to really seek a, a guide from the public and, and put a question like, do you support an immigration level of over 200,000 a year? or between 100 and 200, or less than 100,000 per annum. And I think that sort of guide uh, would then be indicative. It wouldn't be a binding plebiscite. It'd be indicative so the government could at least see the views of the Australian people and act on them. You can't, you can't have a plebiscite that sets the immigration level each year. But I think, I think you could get a guide from the strength of Australian public opinion at a plebiscite, and it wouldn't cost anything at a general election. I think your average voter... Brent would think, isn't it good that I'm getting a say? Yeah, I agree. What other questions do you think should be put in a plebiscite at the next election? Well, I, I'm not against this. I think you could put five or six questions that are topical. Uh, maybe you could ask the opposition. Have you got questions where it'd be useful to get public opinion? I suppose they'd list the Republic. They'd list items about Indigenous reconciliation. On the government side, they could ask a question about immigration. Maybe they could ask a question about border security. You know, that's so contentious. Uh, the Greens are always saying open up the borders, abolish offshore processing. I'm sure your average Australian very clearly would say we want the borders secure, turn back the boats and don't have the drownings between Australia and Indonesia with asylum seekers paying people smugglers. So there's five or six questions right there. What about voluntary assisted dying bill? Uh, yeah, well, that's more a state responsibility. I, I think that's one that Berejiklian government could put up at the next state election. Right. and get some guidance from the public. Yeah, I, I just think if people go to the trouble of voting and, 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 and at no extra cost, you could put those questions forward so that the public has a bigger say. Everyone's annoyed with politics. Everyone say, says the politicians aren't listening, they're out of touch. Well, one way to make them listen is to have these plebiscites so public opinion is aired and the politicians can't ignore the views of the people who pay the bills. True, true. There would be a lot of people agree with what you've just said. Uh, last but not least, boys will be boys. Now, Peter Alexander, we've all heard of Peter Alexander. I bought my wife Peter Alexander pajamas. And um, they're, they're in trouble because they put out a, uh, a pair of pajamas for youngsters that had on the front, boys will be boys. And they received a couple of complaints, and as a direct result of that, Mark, they've pulled them from the shelves. Well, it's, it's hard to believe, isn't it? It is. It, it, it's just incredible. It's just a sign of how... Political correctness has got everyone scared. A company puts out something as harmless as a jumper with a slogan, their boys will be boys, and a couple of complaints, and they pull it off the shelves, costing themselves money, costing their shareholders value. It's just hard to believe that people are so panicked. And at the end of the day, there is a madness out there that maintains that a phrase like that, boys will be boys, somehow is a precursor to male violence against women. Now, you'd have to be insane to think that, but there are people, some of them government-funded, out there running that argument. You know, I've had two sons that when they were little, they played in the dirt, they followed me around the garden, they kicked soccer balls that broke a few things in the backyard, and, and, and I probably said, oh, well, boys will be boys. You know, meaning, well, the young fellow's getting out and having a go, not meaning any harm. So how could you ban a phrase like that? I mean, it's just nuts. It is. What did uh, what was said today? It's uh, there are too many rules. It has to stop. It's gone too far. Nobody can be themselves anymore. Well, let's keep the common sense language of our nation and not let the thought police, the the, the PC 
dietitians try and control our language. You know, I feel like marching up and down the street yelling out, boys will be boys, because I just think <laughs> it's a regular part of, of our conversation as a country. The idea that a clothing company has had to pull that slogan off the front of a, a jumper, expel it from the stores, that, you know, you're starting to think we're in Soviet Russia here or something, aren't we, that, that, that so much is under control or it's all well 1984. It's just way out of control. Yeah, stop the world, I want to get off. Well, that's the feeling. That's what people say. You know, it'd be nice if there was a... You know, Americans have got their First Amendment, which is a free speech provision. And in Australia, we've, we've always been against the Bill of Rights, but I think it's time to write into our federal laws something that protects basic freedom of speech, freedom of speech for, for phrases that mean no harm, that cause no harm. Absolutely. Always good to talk with you, Mark Latham. We've got to go to the news. I thank Pleasure. you for Thanks, your Brent. time. Thank you so much. It's Mark Latham's Outsiders, and we look forward to seeing you on the telly again. And we'll talk to Mark Latham next week, as usual.